three, two, one. Welcome to Potter Familius. Coming to you from Fairhope, Alabama. I'm Todd Sylvester. And I'm Stefan Sylvester. When you first got your first cell phone, how long did you think it was supposed to last? I didn't even think about it at the time. I mean, I got my oh, first. Oh, I did. I got I did. my I, first I cell phone. I always think of longevity of stuff. Fifteen years ago, fourteen years ago. Right. All right. Well, then, in recent history, when you got the phone that you have right now, how long oh, did you well, think it was supposed this, to last? So this was a replacement for um, the phone that was probably my favorite phone that I've ever had. It was that uh, I forget if it was the five, the iPhone five that had the the different colored plastic on the back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I loved that phone. That thing it was, was like the awesome. Five C or something. That's what it was. The yeah. five C because mm-hmm. it was five and colors, so it was yeah. all plastic. It was like the budget version of that iPhone, right. number five. Loved that phone, and it's the only time in my life that I've actually destroyed a phone to the point of where it could not be repaired. Wow, That's and it impressive. was it was random. So I got out of bed and went to grab it off of my nightstand and knocked it off of my nightstand onto carpet. And the carpet in the house that we were living in in Foley must not have been very thick and there must have been concrete directly underneath it because I pushed it off and instead of hearing a thunk like my phone had hit carpet, I heard the sound of shattering glass. (laughs) 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 And the screen was completely cracked all the way through and so I brought it to a repair shop and they were like, yeah, man, there's there's nothing we can do. I'm sorry. There's nothing we can do. It wasn't like they, it. they could have fixed it, but it would have cost the same to fix it versus just getting a new phone. So I upgraded to an 8 and I've had this one for a while. Okay, and but now, when you say a while, see, this is the thing that's frustrating to me. Four years. Yeah, because I'm thinking a phone should last like seven years, especially if we treat it nice. That's why I got so frustrated recently when I didn't get a new phone because a certain manufacturer that happens to be the wealthiest company in the world All right, decided to brick my phone via software. There was nothing wrong with my phone, but apps stopped working. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, you need to update. And then you go to update. It's like, oh, you can't update because you're old. Well, yeah. When did the iPhone that you had before come out? I don't know. It was a long time ago. Okay. So technology in this particular way, so like portable devices, they're not designed to last for they they are designed with the future in mind to a certain point. Yeah. So no, I understand. I, 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 and I kind of see can can we say the name of the company? I don't know. No. Okay. I kind of see their point though because after a while If you let somebody keep a device for, let's say, seven years, the things that they're designing software for their devices at that point is not going to match the experience that they want the user to have. And therefore, it's hurting the brand in their mind. So I get it. Like, I understand. But I also know it's not going to last forever. I I get that. I'm just saying my number is different from their number. How long do you think a nonstick pan should last with heavy use? Well, when you say with heavy use, okay, are you always using, using it, a plastic spatula? Using it all the time. Yeah, always using the a same plastic way. Spatula. You're not letting me make my example. The point is that you use a nonstick pan. If you cook a lot, you use it a lot in the same way that you use a phone a lot. All because right. Now let's use tools then. Okay. Because my cordless tools. They change the batteries. But hang on. Tools aren't the same for the analogy that I was going to use. Okay. So over time, a nonstick pan eventually stops functioning the way that it's supposed to. I'll give you an example. We have a nonstick pan in my house. My wife cooks a lot, and we bought it about four years ago. So it's about as old as my phone. It's fine. But it is definitely not the same (laughs) pan that it was four years ago. So we can continue to use it, but things are starting to stick to it. And so my point is, yeah, it's fine, but it's not doing the thing that it's designed to do as well as it used to. And so after a certain point, it's like there is some gray area there. You can be the type of person like you who uses your phone until you absolutely can't use it anymore because it's not functioning properly. Even though it looked brand new. But why are you getting... I took it out of the case to to send it back for the $50 So you take good care of the outside of your phone. Good job. 
But I what are, take care of everything. Are you supposed to get mad at the company that made the product because they're no. like, oh, it it doesn't work anymore because it is way. By past, the way, you're asking the question. I'm going to answer no. It's way past the point of where we can reasonably expect it to continue functioning. Punch up the main thing. I don't oh want to talk gosh. about this anymore. All right, fine, whatever. This is ridiculous. Should have lasted longer. Should have lasted longer. I think you're just being sensitive. I take it personally. <laughs> it's the main thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up in a household that was filled with very witty people. Unfortunately, their wit oftentimes was utilized in what would be considered sarcastic speech hmm. where we would kind of make fun of such situations and individuals and not always directed even necessarily about the people that were in the room but it it was one of those things where i struggled with being able to really share my feelings without being intimidated by what was going to happen if i threw this stuff out there yeah. kind of opened myself up to <laughs> you know the zingers yes <laughs> and it it unfortunately had an effect on me mm -hmm. to where i struggled when people were trying to utilize intimate speech with me and i'm like i'm, I'm not going there what do you mean by intimate speech uh, if they wanted to, to talk about you know, how they cared about me or loved me or oh, things I like see. that okay so like because, talking about your feelings yeah i felt like i was being baited okay like oh hey todd this is how i feel and I'm like, uh, first of all, I, I feel like I should make fun of you right now because that's what I was trained to do. Right. And secondly, you're probably expecting me to say similar things. and I'm not going to say similar things. So I finally went on, I went on a retreat right, right before I turned 16. Mm -hmm. And it absolutely changed my life. It absolutely changed my life. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go ahead and just open myself up to this. Right on. And with certain people, it worked great. With others, it really was, unfortunately, a setup. And they took advantage of it, you know, type thing. And But I grew to just totally change my behavior when it came to my speech. Mm. And I don't know what happened. There wasn't like some dramatic event where I had the last opportunity to speak to my grandmother on her deathbed or something crazy like that. Yeah. But I started to m mentally think about when I was speaking to people, whether it was the last time I was speaking to them. Oh, wow. And it got me into the habit of always saying, I love you to people. Even now when I do it, it you can tell people react to it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, okay, uh, thanks. Because mm -hmm. uh, they don't know what to say because they're in the same situation that I was before I was 15. Right, people that know you know exactly what to say though. <laughs> What do you mean by that, like, Stefan? Oh, thanks, Todd. It's always so nice to, <laughs> to see you, you know, which is not a bad thing. I'm not making fun. It's just people that know but you. But why is that? They, because they know that you use very positive and affirming speech. And it's really something that I had to develop the habits, though. Which is amazing considering the reputation that you've developed. Because a lot of people know you as the person who gives hugs, loves buses, and says, I love you a lot. And I, I don't mind that I'm very extremely predictable. No, I think it's great. I don't mind. But there have been some people that have even asked me the question. They're like, all right, Todd, I can see that you're getting a good reaction from this. How how do I speak to the people that I, that I love? Yeah. Well, I mean, growing up in our house, it... Do you remember when we were kids, when we had that natural inclination as little kids to sort of be mean to each other and call each other names and yes. stuff? And we thought, because we never heard any swear words, ex except from mom, we never heard any swear words in the house <laughs> or, or people saying nasty things to each other or making fun. We didn't really hear any of that stuff. And until we started watching TV and cartoons, it just wasn't a part of our speech. So we would make things up and we're sort of seeing the same thing happen with my kids. But I, I vividly remember being like, you're like a, you're a muffin face, you know, because like, we didn't know. Whoa, I know. You said that? Yeah. Good thing I didn't hear that. Because we didn't know any other way of getting a rise or getting a reaction out of each other. And 
that's a testament to how clean and relatively like nice the speech in our house was when we were growing up. And right. I think that was you and mom's choice, right? Oh, absolutely. We yeah. were extremely conscious about that because mm-hmm. both of us grew up in, in houses that weren't like that. Right. I would say mine was worse than, than hers. And I, by the way, I'm not judging because I don't know the house that my dad grew up in or my mm-hmm. mom grew up in. Yeah. The little that I knew of my grandparents that doesn't really tell you what kind of life they lived or why I I got to that point where I'm like, do you remember what the first like cuss word was in our house that I was like, you are absolutely not allowed to say that to one another. Do you remember what it was? No, I don't. It was stupid. We jumped all over that mm-hmm. like like we made you think that you were saying the f word right and i said and i remember time. i remember feeling like stupid and shut up and dumb oh, oh. dumb all those words i remember Brutal. thinking like those are the bad ones yeah you know yeah they are and then when i learned actual swear words it didn't have the the same power that i guess was imprinted on my childhood mind as those original bad words quote unquote yeah because it, it was the tearing down i mean that was the thing and and i'm not a sailor so we weren't going to allow you know the actual cuss words in the house mm. but it was the tearing down because for me this is how i feel about it okay and as a christian of course jesus being the example for me i just don't see him I know some people are like, oh, well, look at the end of John's gospel. If, if we wrote down everything that he did and said, then the whole world couldn't contain the books. Mm-hmm. So people are like, well, you don't know exactly what Jesus had said beyond what's recorded in the gospel. But if you go thematically, I just don't see him using sarcasm. I don't see him tearing people down. It doesn't mean that sometimes you can't speak those hard truths. Well, wait, hold on. So... Are we just going to ignore all the times when Jesus was a punk, kind of? What do you mean? In Scripture, there are moments where I'm thinking specifically of um, how he spoke to the the Pharisees quite a bit. He would just straight up call out their hypocrisy. That, and oftentimes, okay. hold on, hold on a second, hold on. I know it's not necessarily sarcasm, but it's not like Jesus was a person who only said nice things ever. And it's dumb to portray him that way. He was the type of person who would speak the truth even when it was hard to hear. Did, we're, we're, I don't know if you were paying attention to what I said. I, I'm not saying that he did not speak hard truths, but he did not ever speak sarcastically. Yeah, but he said those hard truths in a way that was designed to draw attention to the people who were refusing to recognize it. And I would argue that that indicates that he was at least capable of speaking that way. If not, it's it's not recorded necessarily that he did it. So I don't know if I agree with, with the assessment here. because yeah, You don't have to agree. And, and that's, that's fair. But I also think about the way that he was portrayed by Jim Caviezel in The Passion. Right. Remember his relationship with Mary yeah. and how that's shown? Yeah. And how she's kind of fussing at him and nagging at him a little bit. And then he splashes the water in her face when right. he's washing his hands. And it's all clearly in good fun and okay, playful. So let's let's go to that scene. Mm-hmm. And he splashes the water. And he goes, Mom, you're an idiot. Get me some food. Any problem that's, with that? That's not what happened. I know. This is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, you're not paying attention. You're not paying attention to what I'm trying to tell you. I, I think we're I both think, misfiring. No, to no, each we're other. not. <laughs> because you think that sarcasm covers a way broader span of ways that you can talk to someone than it actually does. Okay, explain. The type of thing that you are talking about is being sarcastic in an intentional way to hurt someone. Well, sarcasm is going to hurt. I mean, the word means to tear at one's flesh. But sarcasm, when it's used in a way that is clearly understood by both parties that are involved to not be serious can be something different from what you're describing. I, I and, wouldn't even define that as sarcasm. I, I would define well, then that what as, would you call it? as being silly. And it's very different. Because being silly doesn't hurt. Sarcasm is designed in its essence to hurt, even though some people say, get over it, or we're just friends, that's why we can speak this way. It 
is designed to hurt. That's why it means to tear at one's flesh. Hmm. Sacra. Okay. To tear at the flesh. So what would you call it when, and I'm thinking specifically of a relationship that I have with a, a friend of mine. What would you call it if you can playfully, and it's above board, everybody understands exactly what's going on, that not a word of what you are saying is meant to be taken seriously, that you can do things like, you know, call each other names or swear at each other. Not that I'm saying that's a good thing, but I do have that type of relationship with this one friend who I'm thinking of. And the only reason that it's okay for us to do that is because both of us are aware that we are 100% kidding. Right. Personally, I would say that that's a, a deficiency. Even though we're using the exact same words that yes. a person was who's being sarcastic yes. is being. You think that's completely different? Yes. No, I, I do. I, I do think it's completely different. I think that for me, the gift of speech should be utilized at a higher plane, at a higher level. Wait, and, but what if the, the words are the same? What do you mean? The words that I would use with this friend are the same things that if I were to say to somebody who wasn't aware that I was being sarcastic and I didn't have a close friendship with, they would take them very hurtfully. And it no, wouldn't be good. That's why I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying what you're doing with your friend is wrong. Seriously? Yes. I'm, I'm completely serious. Even though... Even though you both the, are like, best of we're my, cool with it. To the, no, no, no. It's not that we're saying we're cool with it. It actually is something that deepens our friendship with one another. And I'll explain why. So there are not very many people that I am willing to assume that they know I'm kidding right. if I use some of those words. Right. And there's a handful of friends where I know for a fact that I can say some of these things playfully. And you might say, well, you shouldn't speak that way to anybody. It's like, all right, well, our friendship was based on us talking to each other this way when we first met because we could tell that there was no tension, there was no misunderstanding. And so it was very freeing to be able to joke around with this person in a very sarcastic way. And the reason why it's actually in my head completely different from if somebody were to be like, say something that's half joking using the same words and you can mm -hmm. tell they're half joking, but right. they're kind of serious right. that I would be like, whoa, 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 time out. And it immediately changes the air in the room. It doesn't happen with this particular friend of mine because we both are aware that we are kidding. And it's the fact that we know that that allows us to speak freely. And therefore, even though we're using the same words that somebody who's being sarcastic would use, it's only because of our friendship that it works. I completely understand what you're saying. I'm not I, trying to justify it. I'm just saying that you I don't, don't even have to justify it to me. You're an adult. You can live any way that you want. And, and these are friendships that you have that have nothing to do with my life. It's not like you're doing this around me, my children, you know, where I would say, Whoa. yeah, because there's a time and a place. Yes. And this is, but please understand if you're really asking how I feel about it, mm -hmm. I think there's something wrong with that. But why? Because it, the words don't make sense. Like if you really care about an individual, mm -hmm. my personal feeling is the words should then be, regardless of the circumstance of, oh, we understand that we're kidding. JK, LOL. Mm -hmm. it, the words to me are so important and they have such depth and such weight to them that it shouldn't be something where it's said lightly mm. when you really do care about someone. I we used to work at a furniture uh, place at delivering furniture and I, I, my car wasn't running. So the, the guy that I work with gave me a ride home and we're driving home and he's, you know, talking to me and being all cool and stuff because he was a year or two older than me. And as we're driving, he veers into the other lane and there's an oncoming car and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to die. Why did I get a ride home from this guy? And he swerves back and he honks the horn and he gives the finger to the person that was he was playing chicken with. And the other guy's given the finger to us. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking now they're going to pull out guns and I'm dead. And he kind of hits the brakes, swerves and then goes, ha, 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 that guy's such an a-hole. Blah, 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 blah. He goes, he's my best friend. And I'm sitting there going that was so trippy. Mm -hmm. That was like the weirdest experience I've had, ever had in my life. First yeah. of all, we all almost died because you were being playful with your best friend yeah. <laughs> with automobiles. And then 
the the behavior of giving each other the finger and the cussing and everything like that, mm-hmm. it seemed so out of place. Everything that added up to the last phrase. Yeah. That's my best friend. And I'm looking at him going, wait, what did you just say? Mm-hmm. Like it just didn't make sense. And I'm not saying that this friend of yours, you have to always go to them and go, man, you're the best person. And no, I, just I know. Love you. I know that's not what you're saying, but there's a couple of things about and I'm trying not to give more specific details about what we actually say, because it is probably inappropriate for this podcast. But there's a, a couple of things about our relationship, which started all the way back when I was in college, mm-hmm. by the way, that make our friendship like make our interactions, let's say, substantially different from what you just described. First of all, I would never put my life or his life in danger as a joke. Like he's he's a gun owner and I would never jokingly pick up one of his guns and point it at him because I thought it was funny. Okay. It, l- Which is the equivalent of what that su- guy was doing in this car. Then subtract the car stuff. Okay. So do you know what happens after we have one of those interactions where we're using the same words that you would use to be sarcastic? Normally it ends with me giving him a hug and telling him that I love him. Okay. And the reason for that is because we are giving what I think for, for a lot of Southern guys, obviously it's more so for him than for me, but for a lot of Southern guys, one of the ways that they sort of work themselves up to being vulnerable emotionally is by using sarcasm and for him it's like he has to be a little sarcastic before he can be vulnerable enough to say that he loves me okay and that's just how our relationship is so right again you you don't have to justify it i know but i feel like you're not understanding what i am trying to express here because you think that sarcasm is bad no matter what i do then i guess we disagree yeah and it's okay for us to disagree because i i'm gonna say that there's something missing then in him in the way he relates if he needs that Mm -hmm. to be able to get to the point where he can hug you and say that he loves you yeah and for a lot of people that they need something and i get that but i think that we should be growing and developing to the point where then we don't need anything before we can say i love you Hmm. because that's the way we should live that's the place where we should be yeah and that's an ideal and i feel like I mean, I'm speaking from personal experience here. I don't know if I'm comfortable forcing that way of interacting and speaking Uh, on, on, no, 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 hang on, let me finish. I don't know if I'm comfortable forcing that way of interacting with the people that I love on everyone that I love. And the reason for it is because no matter how I feel about using those words and the ways that it's appropriate for me to, let's say, use intimate speech with somebody where I'm revealing what I'm actually right. feeling. Right. No matter how I feel about it, if I use it and I don't, you know, let's say play the game, so to speak, with the different people that I have different and unique relationships with, who I love dearly, but all in completely different ways, I am essentially forcing them to either match what I'm doing or to walk away. I personally don't think I, I don't like the word force. Mm-hmm. That's where, where I... That's exactly what I'm doing. Okay, but I don't agree. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's a force. I think it's an invitation. Yeah, but when the invitation is do this or like allow your insecurities to make you not want to talk to me right now, that's not an invitation. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to disagree. Because for some of these people, if I wanted to exclusively use affirming loving language and not use any negative humor, sarcasm, mm-hmm. snarkiness of any kind, right. it would be a process. Yeah. And the process would involve me doing things that will potentially make this person uncomfortable to talk to me and potentially not want to talk to me anymore. And so I'm looking ahead. Now I know that that's not always going to happen, but it's like if you are vulnerable from the get-go with somebody. And I know this from experience because I used to, I think, misuse vulnerability to try and get close to people. Mm -hmm. And that's not a good or healthy thing because you can only be vulnerable and be comfortable doing so with somebody. You can only use that type of loving, intimate speech with someone that you truly love if you know that it's going to be reciprocated and understood. Okay, and then I, I agree with that. So all that being said, 
if I jump into using that language, let's say, with this friend who I'm kind of sarcastic with, and that's how I talk to him, the first thing that he would say to me is like, are you okay? He'd be like, is something, like what's, what's going on? You all right? All right, let me, let me ask you this one. What if you said to him, because you guys obviously have known one another for, for years. We have. And you're very close. Yeah. If you said, listen, I'm just not comfortable speaking this way anymore with you because I, I, I just, I care about you. Mm -hmm. And it just feels weird saying these things. And if I said that, he would be like, man, I care about you too. That's the only reason why I'm, I'm comfortable speaking this way to you. See, to me, that just doesn't seem to make sense in my head. It makes perfect sense to me. Okay, and it can. I, that, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just telling you from my but own personal experiences, and I'm not jumping into, by the way. You, you're making it seem, because you've had a relationship with this person for years. Mm -hmm. You don't just meet someone and go, I love you. Give yeah, me a hug. No, of course not. And that's not what I'm suggesting you're saying, but it does sound like you're saying that something is wrong with my relationship with this person because of the way that we speak to each other. I, I am saying that. Seriously? Yeah. I, I'm saying that if you really do love someone, it doesn't make sense in my mind to say those kinds of things to one another, even in jest. But think about the psychology of it. It's like, I, I know that some of these things are cutting and biting, but I also understand the dance of a friendship when he's coming from a place where he doesn't do intimacy or vulnerability very well. Okay. And in order to get to a place where we can be vulnerable with one another and deepen that friendship that we've had for a long time, I have to, and I, I say have to, I'm choosing to engage in that right. sarcastic snarky conversation. And it works because there is no venom behind any of it. There's nothing. All of it is ex like explicitly obviously meant to be a joke okay and not just a joke but something that is funny because it's not something that we believe about one another again i get it yeah i completely understand the situation you've mapped it out very well for me i just completely disagree wow. i think there should be some other way to get there some other way to get there especially can you imagine if uh, all the things that you're saying if you can't share it on this podcast what happens if one of your kids walks in the room and you're trying to explain that to them later on i mean it mm. just you know it, it to, to me it's just nonsensical now i i understand because i've had people to this day that are like todd you're an idiot like i don't get you and and i do care about you but you know it the way you live is just stupid I mean, I've, I've had people tell me that. Wow. And these are people that I'm close with, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I, I have to let that go because it's like, I, I'm, I'm not here to change everyone, but I am here to live a certain way. And that's fair. But I mean, I feel like my presence in the life of this friend of mine is affecting positive change. And I don't feel like I need to change the way that I'm talking to him in order to be literally be Christ to him. Since I'm not in the middle of that, I can't judge that. And I don't yeah, know but, what, I, I don't know what but, you're called but to. But you did just judge it. Well, yes. We, we all have blanket judgments that, that we just think, I don't think we should ever be speaking that way, ever. Fair. Okay? Now, there are, I'm sure are people listening right now like, Todd, you don't understand. I work with gangs. <laughs> like I'm, I'm down in the South and, Bronx. And I think somebody who really is in that situation would probably be like, okay, you don't understand the practical aspects of what I'm trying to do. And it's not like I think of my friendships as ministry all the time, but I do think that, you know, the Lord works through us in ways that make sense because of who we are. Right. And that is something that I actually treasure about my relationship with, with this friend of and mine. And you can continue to. Like and I said, I, again, I am not the judge. And that's that's fair. I I don't know. I think there's room for uh, for more ways of speaking to the people that, that you love. And I, I think that's true based on my own experiences. So I guess it's just an anecdote. But at the same time, like... <sighs> I don't know. I don't want to put that kind of a blanket statement on people speaking to the the ones that they love because I think there's lots of ways to do it that are not at all hurtful, even if you're not using words that you and I would necessarily use. Right. And but my 
my experience is that people do justify a lot. Yeah, and, and that's fair. And I grew up, like I said, in a house where it was very sarcastic. Mm -hmm. And I pretty much knew that everyone was joking. It still at times hurt. Yeah, but pretty much is not the same as I know. Okay, and you can say I know. I, I, I don't know if your friend in here would be able to 100% say there was never a time where that had a negative effect on me ever. Yeah, and I, I would be confident that he would say that, but I can't speak for him. Right. So I don't know because we, we've never really had that conversation. It's just it's always been understood that we, we are kidding. And it's it's funny because we don't actually feel this way about each other. Right. And that's what allows our, our friendship to continue. So I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe it's something where I have to do some soul searching. I'm not sure. But um, I do think that, by the way, I, I want to be clear about this to the listeners on the podcast is that I'm not in any way advocating sarcastic, negative speech or swearing or, or any of that stuff. And Except in certain situations. No, I didn't advocate it. This is all anecdotal. This is all personal to me. But then if someone has the same situation, then you're advocating it. Absolutely not. Um, you, okay. Do you know what advocating means? Yeah. Okay. Then why are you asking me this question? Be because in s you're saying that... I'm saying in my friendship with this person, this is an example of using speech that you said cannot possibly be used with somebody that you love if you really love them. Right in a way that I believe is actually loving. But you're saying that there are those situations where it is. For it, me. Right. That means that it has to possibly apply to other people. Yeah, but I'm not advocating it. Those two things aren't the same. Okay. Advocating would mean, hey, go out and talk sarcastically to the people that you love if that's the way that you love them. If that's it, not what I'm saying. If it works for them. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there are more ways to talk to the people that you love than you are saying that there are. Okay. And I'm not saying you have to go out and do it. That's, uh, we're, then we're misunderstanding what the definition is. Okay. Because I'm saying you can't do it. So advocating doesn't mean uh, saying it's good and encouraging people to do it. Right. It, it means it's sanctioned. Yeah, but I didn't say it's, it's allowed. I didn't say it's good. And that has nothing to do with sanctioning. I'm not telling people. But you that, did say it was good in your it's personal good for me. relationship. Right. Right. So I'm so saying. So is it only exclusively okay, hold for on, you and hold your on. friend? So you, and you, you a minute ago said that you cannot. And correct me if I'm wrong about yeah. this. You a minute ago said that you don't think that sarcastic speech should be used with anyone that you actually love. Correct. Okay. I am saying I disagree because of my anecdotal situation. Right. That's it. Okay. That's all I'm saying. And I was trying to make a point of I I feel bad for our listeners that I am talking about a situation that I can't like fully explain all the things that I've said because some of it is not appropriate for a clean podcast. Right. So and thank you for not so, sharing. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like we you're don't welcome. Have a button. But but seriously, like button. that's what that's what I mean by I might have some personal soul searching to do is like, well, I mean, is it am I comfortable with the fact that that's a part of, of my life in that way? Well, probably not. And I'm working on that. But the point remains that as far as I'm concerned with the morality of the situation, it's like aside from some of these words I probably shouldn't use, sarcastic speech in this particular way, when it's understood properly, I don't think falls into the category that you're talking about. But okay. we can agree to disagree. All right. And and that's the cool part about Potter for Ladies. Yeah. You get to hear all the viewpoints, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> On a, a last minute thing is my recommendation is if there are people in your in your life that you love, which I'm hoping that there are mm -hmm. lots of them, then as best as you can because i know some people really struggle with those three words together i love you but it'd be so good for you to tell the people that you love that you love them yes if you can at least do that then you're probably in a good place amen amen we have the best listeners in the world yes we do thanks so much for listening to potter familias we'll see y'all soon <laughs>